Hey there everybody, it's Nathan Cool with NathanCoolPhoto.com and in this video I want to show you a problem of white balance that can be affected by triggers in your camera's hot shoe. Now you might think to yourself that just doesn't make any sense and to me originally it didn't either. But I want to show you a problem that can affect auto white balance by using triggers even when they're in manual mode, non-TTL mode, just purely manual mode. I want to show you what's causing that problem. I want to show you then different ways that you can fix it. Now this has nothing to do with the lights that you're using. It has nothing to do with the software. This is a hardware problem that you can resolve. Now I've reached out to Godox which is uh, kind of one of the root of one of these problems and I'm still working with those engineers to try to resolve something possibly in another firmware release. But this is something where you might have seen like oh you've changed brand of lights but this brand of light seems to be shooting too warm. Let me show you an example. So here we have an ambient shot, and this is uh, pretty much accurate to colors as there really weren't any other uh, affecting white balances from incandescent lights or whatever. And here's a flash shot. We can see here those colors pretty much match, and that's good. We never rely on the ambient color, but we are relying on the flash color. Now this particular flash shot was taken with just a cactus trigger, just a dumb trigger. This other shot though, this was shot using an X-Pro trigger, uh, or also if it's flash point instead of Godox, flash point would be the R2 Pro trigger. These triggers are notorious. You can see it has warmed this picture up quite a bit. So what's causing that problem? It is a hardware issue. It has nothing to do with the lights. In fact, the white balance could have been corrected in post-processing, but you can solve that issue before you ever get to post-processing by just correcting a few simple things. But where is this coming from? And then what can you do about it? Let's dive a little deeper into this and see what I'm talking about. You ready to take a look? Let's get started. So here we can take a look a little closer at what's going on by opening these raw files into uh, Nikon's Capture NXD. This will give me more information to what's going on than if I use, for instance, Adobe's Lightroom. So this is just to get behind what's actually going on. So here we have our ambient shot. And in this ambient shot, we can see it looks very ambient, no big deal. Then what I did is I did some testing here, did a flash shot, and of course showed you this one. And if I zoomed in here real close, I left myself notes to see what trigger I was using. This was using the cactus trigger. Now the colors look fairly well here and you can see the white balance comes in at about 4600 Kelvin. Once I used then the R2 Pro trigger, everything warmed up a lot. So just by changing from a dumb trigger to a smart trigger, then we've got these problems. Now if you're not familiar with uh, smart triggers and dumb triggers and some of these trigger setups, I have a, a video online, there's a, uh, a link up here if you look in the top right that'll guide you to uh, that particular video to help you out with triggers. Also, I have more information in my books, uh, especially the interiors book, and uh, although you won't need it for this video, there is a link down in the description of this video for all the books in my real estate photography series. Anyways, we can see the problem here is that it warmed it up. So what though is causing this problem? So once again, comparing the two, this is using the R2 Pro trigger or if it's Godox X Pro. And then over here, we've got just a simple dumb trigger, which is actually doing a much better job than the R2 Pro. So let's take a look at why that's happening. Let's take a look at the EXIF data. So if we take a look at the EXIF data, which in Capture NXD is much more detailed than what you'd have uh, in Adobe's uh, Lightroom. So here we can see on the EXIF data on the right that the flash, it shows nothing. There was no device because the dumb trigger wasn't detected. Same thing would happen if you're taking an ambient shot. It doesn't know anything about flash because it doesn't think anything was there, anything happened. Because there was no feedback from a dumb device. So the cactus trigger has no feedback back into the camera. Once we though get to the R2 Pro trigger, we can see that there's a whole lot of EXIF information here for the flash. Uh, to summarize everything that was here, it detected that the device was incorrectly detected as an SB900, in other words, not the R2 Pro trigger, but it was detected as a, a speed light of Nikon's. It shows that the flash sync mode was rear curtain as was set in the camera. And then there was a whole bunch of other information for master group A, group B, group C information for these different flashes, just what would have been also uh, out of a possible Nikon device. But one of the big things down here, advanced operations also showed bounce flash. But the thing was here is that the R2 Pro trigger advertised itself incorrectly as an SB900. 
That information then is used by the Nikon software, or if you're using Canon, it would have been the same thing, or Sony. The camera uses this flash information thinking that this is a native device. It then knows what the color temperature should be and how to then adjust for the auto white balance. So once again, if I shoot something with a dumb trigger, that's not a problem. There's no uh, device information available, so the camera has to make its auto white balance adjustments, its setting for auto white balance, based off of what it actually then measures throughout the scene. But if it detects, if the camera detects that there's a known device, it can then take that information and start to derive other things out of it to then try to make a better auto white balance setting. So the thing here is that the, the there's a bug, obviously, in the R2 Pro trigger and in the X Pro that it should not be advertising itself like this. So what can you do about it? Well, there's a few things. Let's take a look at the camera hot shoe. So the first thing we see in the camera hot shoe is that there are more than one pin, and this is important. This is where the root of it comes in. The center pin is the pin that tells anything that's in, sitting in the hot shoe to fire. It sends a signal to actuate. It just merely closes a switch. That's all that it does. But these other uh, pins that you have in the hot shoe, and some cameras have three, like on uh, this Nikon camera, it has three extras, some have four. So that's all for camera intelligence. It's things that allow allows then more information to be uh, read back and forth between the camera and what's sitting in the hot shoe. And that, those pins are what's being used then by these smart transmitters like the R2 Pro and of course the Godox X Pro. So what can you do about it? Well, your first thought may be to tape over those contacts. I really wouldn't suggest doing that on a $1,500, $2,000 camera. What you can do instead, there are some other things. One thing, you can attach one of these on there. This is a, a single pin adapter. They're kind of hard to find nowadays because uh, hot shoes and transmitters are so wireless. It's, it's kind of a thing from the olden days where you can see though there's just one center pin and that center pin allows then just the fire signal to be sent up to the transmitter. So you would stack your then, you would this onto the hot shoe and then you would slide your X Pro transmitter into that. So that's one option. If you can't find one of these, sometimes you'll find some with multiple pins. These cost like $10. You could take one of these and then tape over. If it does have multiple pins, use a black electric tape, the non-conductive tape, to tape over all those other contacts except for the center pin. That's one way to do it. But there are other options besides that, which are pure hardware related issues and something that you won't have to then kludge too badly. One thing that I like is to still use my dumb triggers as a stack. Now, if you notice here in the dumb trigger, this is just a cactus trigger, and of course the dumb name you might know from, from my interiors book is just because it's not sending intelligence. It's just sending the fire signal, that one pin in the center. You can then stack the X Pro or the R2 Pro trigger on top of that. Now, that then does the same thing. It allows just a pass through of that one single center pin. Very important though, to be a pass through device, a lot of these dumb triggers like the Cactus require that that trigger, the dumb trigger, be put into TX, transmit mode. Otherwise, it's off. There's no electrical current that'll pass between the camera and then its hot shoe up to the trigger. Once you do that, though, then you're eliminating all of that other information and you're not going to have to worry about device detection then auto white balance being off. So another option still besides doing this is to use an incompatible trigger in the hot shoe. For instance, this is a Nikon camera uh, that I'm using, but here I'm using a Canon R2 Pro trigger. Using that gives me the same results. In fact, if we take a look at the EXIF data for that, we would see that there is no information that's being passed up to that uh, from the camera to the trigger or from the trigger back down to the camera, and that solves the issue as well. So if anybody is telling you that the trigger in your hot shoe cannot possibly be affecting the color temperature of your pictures, they're only partially right. It's actually an effect of the auto white balance calculation in your camera, which then when you bring that picture up into a Lightroom or some other editing software, it's going to look way too warm. So this is something that needs to be addressed by the trigger manufacturer. And once again, I've reached out to Godox. The engineers have gotten back with me. I've given them steps to 
replicate this, they are looking into it in different ways to fix it. The most ideal for my suggestion is that when you're in manual mode, disable the pins, the other pins except for the fire pin, or do not send any information, do not advertise what that device is because they're advertising it incorrectly anyways as a kludge to try to make their TTL work. So being a third party uh, piece of equipment, not a Nikon piece of equipment, they don't, they can't advertise what they are because the camera would never detect it. So anyways, it's a kind of a kludge on their end to begin with to be falsely advertising what they are to make the camera work in TTL mode. Either way, manual mode should not have any of this information. So until they actually work around that problem, until they come up with a fix for it, which I'm sure there would probably just be a firmware fix that they would release, I don't know yet, but until they do, you do have the alternatives. Once again, the main goal is to avoid all pins in the hot shoe except for the center pin. The center pin is fire and everything's fine. So you can either do that by putting in a single pin adapter, you can put in a multi-pin adapter and then in the top of that cheap multi-pin adapter tape over all the contacts except for the center pin with non-conductive electric tape. That's not my preferred method. The first one would be. Another preferred method that I would suggest is you can then use, as I showed, a, a dumb trigger in between. So you use a trigger stack. Now, when you're doing that, you also have the added advantage that you can fire other types of dumb triggers. So if you have other incompatible brands of lights that are attached to the dumb triggers, like I show in the interiors book, then you've got the best of both worlds. You can control flash power and flash off of the compatible uh, uh, trigger, the uh, smart trigger, for instance, the R2 to, to trigger all your flash point lights. You can use the dumb trigger to be uh, doing other things, maybe Nikon lights or Canon lights or newer lights or even your young Nuo lights. Anything that you have, then you can uh, get the best of both worlds by being able to completely intermix all those lights. And of course, then the third option is just to buy a, a trigger that is incompatible with your camera. Now, you might think that that doesn't make sense, but that compatibility is only there for really for TTL. That's it. it. You can still control the lights. You can still control the, 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 the power out of them. Everything's exactly the same. The compatibility of these smart triggers is only for the camera's TTL mode to communicate back and forth with those flash units as though they were their own flash units doing their TTL calculations. So anyways, I hope this was useful for you. I'm going to be getting back more information from the Godox engineer soon. Also, by the way, I've got a new light that I'm going to be testing out soon. I'm going to be getting more information on that coming up. But I hope that this, if you're using some of these smart triggers, you've been seeing this problem, that this will be helpful for you and that you can use some of this in your photography as well. If you did like this video, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It won't cost anything. And as soon as one of these videos is posted, you'll be the first to know. Thanks a lot for watching. Until next time, take care, be safe, and get out there and shoot something.